guys, thanks for clicking on this video. I am so glad you are here. You'll never guess it, you guys. I'm doing another book review. This has been a long time coming. If you follow me on Instagram, you'd probably know that I read this many, many, many moons ago and was planning on doing a review. And then what happened? Nothing. I still wanted to do a review on this because I feel like it's important. And I read it and I took so many notes. So I'm finally doing my review of Bob Goff, Love Does. This is a very, very popular book. Tons of people love this book, but I knew nothing. I knew absolutely nothing about this book other than what you could maybe assume from the title, Love Does. So I was like, okay, it's obviously about um, maybe like the action of love. I have a hot beverage so that we can feel cozy and so I can feel relatable. It is hot chocolate because, you know, I thought against having caffeine this late in the day. Don't forget to use coasters, kids. I guess I should tell you, <laughs> it's not fresh in my mind. I did read this um, a few months ago. So it's not like I necessarily remember everything in vivid detail. That's why I have my notebook here, but I'm obviously not gonna go through all my notes. I just wanna touch on some very specific things that I think, <sighs> okay. <laughs> I'm trying to like allude to where I'm going with this, but spoiler alert, I did not like this book. And so the purpose of me making this video is not to just be like super negative. It's not to come off and say that Bob Goff is a terrible person. <laughs> it, not saying that at all. It's also not saying that anybody who liked this book was wrong, you know? Um, I personally would kind of ask why you liked this book because I just found a lot of, um, a lot of issues. But anyways, I just wanted to give kind of some of the more major critiques that I have toward the book in hopes that it can help people be a little bit more discerning when they read Christian authors because, quote unquote, Christian authors, there's a ton of authors in the Christian genre and a lot of them, you know, aren't Christians. I'm not saying that about Bob Goff, but I'm saying we just need to have more discernment to not just take someone at their word to say, hey, slap Christian on the book and that this is truth. It's like, no. <laughs> the scripture and the Bible is truth. A Christian author is writing about things that are contrary to scripture, then that's a cause for major concern and we need to just be discerning of that. So there are some things in this book that concerned me. Honestly, the goal of this is to be helpful, not to just be negative. The most aggravating was that there was not one single mention of scripture no scriptural context no scripture at all and that is concerning to me to have a christian book have absolutely no reference of scripture in it as christians we need to be held accountable to each other and accountable to the word of god if you're not mentioning scripture then no one can fact check you unless they know the scriptures. Right off the bat, the introduction is all about Bob. That's all I wrote was like, it's all about Bob. If you've ever seen the movie, What About Bob? Basically, this book could be a movie of Bob's life and it just could be titled, It's All About Bob. It just kind of puts him on this pedestal where he just appears to be like this superhuman. Like he's just like this crazy, Christian who does everything amazing. You're kind of set up to admire Bob. I don't know if there was any mention of God or Jesus in the introduction, maybe like once in passing. So that kind of worried me right off the bat, but I have to say I did try and hold out hope even till the very end. I always tried to give him the benefit of the doubt saying, hey, maybe this chapter will be the best chapter yet and will redeem all the other ones I didn't like. Yeah, so chapter eight, my little paragraph that I give for every chapter trying to summarize what it was, it was just, Jesus said, Jesus said, Jesus said. I said so many paraphrases, but no scripture. And that's laced throughout, but I think in this chapter specifically, it was just over and over and over again to the point where I'm just like, please just give me some sort of scripture. Trust me, it's for everybody's good, at least, okay, 
here's the thing at the very least if you're not going to actually like list it in the book put it in the back okay like have all your references to like the stories that you're telling from the Bible so that people can go and look them up. This is the first Christian book that I've read that doesn't have any notes in the back. And this isn't like a rule of thumb, but the books that I typically get the most out of have a huge margin in the back of just notes and references. He just didn't set it up for you to be able to gain any sort of resources from him. Chapter 11, I haven't necessarily read through all my notes, so this will be interesting. I begin my notes by saying, yikes. The one who has invited us is way more powerful than any of the impediments we think we're facing. And he has just one message for us. He leans forward and whispers quietly to each of us, there's more room. <laughs> I remember thinking this was so creepy. I have a couple complaints about this. He makes Jesus whisper in your ear a lot. Like he like sets it up where Jesus whispers in your ear and I just, I don't know. I just feel like that's just a little cringy. Like, and like, why are you saying that he's doing that when he's clearly not doing that? Also, his one message would not be, there's more room. It's very clear in scripture. Jesus's one message was repent and trust the gospel like over and over and over again repent and trust in me you know like that was his message because that's what's most important is that your soul is saved that you're saved from your sins that's what he came to do so therefore his one message would have to do something with that he just really didn't talk about the gospel at all like how do you have a christian book and you not talk about the gospel that's what's important that's the crux of everything okay chapter 14 Quote, the Bible story of Siva's sons ends with them getting their butts kicked. Not my words, the Bible's. But I'm gonna look up this, which is in Acts 19, starting in verse 13. Then some of the itinerant Jewish exorcists undertook to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who had evil spirits, saying, I adjure you by the Jesus whom Paul proclaims. Seven sons of a Jewish high priest named Siva were doing this, but the evil spirit answered them, Jesus, I know, and Paul, I recognize, but who are you? And the man in whom was the evil spirit leaped on them, mastering all of them and overpowering them so that they fled out of the house, of that house naked and wounded. The concept should have been great, okay? It was about not faking your faith or being fed by false teachers, but instead, Bob, I almost called Bob Paul. Bob, you are not Paul. But instead, Bob uses a verse about a possessed man. There's just so many other verses. There's so many other stories in the Bible that could have related to faking your faith or being fed by false teachers. And this was the story. Basically, like the demon possessed man attacked these guys and they ran away naked. You know, he says, they got, they got their butts kicked. Not my words, but the Bibles. The Bible actually doesn't say that though. Like if you're going to say like, not my words, the Bibles, but those are your words. Like that is your phrasing. The Bible, like you could have just said, they got uh, beaten up and they ran away naked and wounded. Not my words, the Bibles. And that would have been true and would have made the same impact and you wouldn't actually have been lying. I was just like very confused by that because I am fascinated by false, okay, this sounds so weird. I'm fascinated by false teachers, but like I enjoy discernment ministries a lot. I've just always had like some sort of more fascination in things like that. And so I was really excited to have a chapter about false teachers. I was so looking forward to it and I got absolutely nothing out of it. Chapter 15, quote, Jesus didn't try and recruit people. My commentary was, what about the 12 disciples? Weren't all of them recruited? <laughs> chapter 16, quote, these days the view of God I hold on to isn't him being mad because I've missed the mark. 
It's the one of him scooping me into his arms and carrying me away to get healed, unquote. And I said, I get the sense from this chapter that Bob avoids all scripture that talks about God's wrath and instead has a picture of only his grace. But we can't separate the two. God is angry with sinners and he also loves them. And I said, ahem, the gospel. I get frustrated with Christian books that only talk about God's grace because that's the only thing that like makes people feel good is like knowing that God is a gracious God. And yeah, it makes me feel good too. Like it will bring me to tears when I realize how gracious God is. But if you don't realize how sinful you are, God's grace is robbed of its deep meaning. Chapter 20, my first note was stop making God whisper to you. Seriously, it was so creepy. I don't know, I just don't like that imagery of God just like leaning down and whispering to you like, I don't know, maybe that's how he sees God, but that's not really necessarily the God I see portrayed in scripture as someone who just like leans down and whispers in your ear. Kind of weird. He talks about never hearing God audibly but in many other ways, which ironically, he makes God talk a lot in this book. He like gives God words. Um, quote, there are accounts of what Jesus said and sometimes what he didn't say. All of these are good signposts and they should be enough. Besides, we shouldn't speak with an assurance we don't really have like we're God's PR agent and risk misquoting the God of the universe who could turn us into a pile of salt, unquote. Wow, Bob, awesome. You've been doing that this whole book though. You've been misquoting God. You have been adding words to him saying, God said this, Jesus said this, God said this, not my words, the Bibles. And it's been wrong. I can't tell you every single time he said, Jesus said, God told me this, Jesus, you know, like all this stuff, but he's been doing it the entire book. And then he says this, which is a quote, I would absolutely put a stamp of approval on and say, yes, I totally agree, but because you're the one that's saying this and you've been doing the contrary this whole book, I can't really say that this is a great quote. He's been doing exactly what he's saying we shouldn't be doing in this quote. Chapter 24, quote, Jesus hardly talked about what he'd done. Instead, Jesus modeled that we don't need to talk about everything we've done. It's like he was saying, if we were just to do awesome, incredible stuff together while we were here on earth, and the fact that only he knows would be enough. Even then though, don't take the bait that if we do incredible things, Jesus will dig us more. He can't, he already digs us more. And more than that, our pictures are already in his wallet. I hate this illustration. God digs us, like, just some of the language that he uses to describe God is just so low. It bothers me because this is the God of the universe. We should have higher and loftier words to describe him. We should glorify and honor him with the words that we use to describe him. God digs us. Our pictures are in his wallet. Like just kind of these weird, just like low analogies. I'm not about it. I'm not about it. There's other ways to explain that God cares about us and he loves us. Quote, Jesus's message is a simple one. True, let's go, let's see where this is going. We all get a chance to be awesome if we want to be. Not surprisingly, the way to do it best is by being secretly incredible, unquote. We aren't the ones who are awesome, Jesus is. God doesn't want us to be awesome. He wants us to point to his awesomeness and realize that we can't be awesome apart from him. Bob is missing the gospel. He's missing the point that we aren't the ones who are awesome and we aren't the ones who can just become awesome. To be secretly incredible, that's his message to us. It's not, that, that's nowhere in scripture. Chapter 25, Th this is um, I think one of his best attempts at explaining the gospel. Like the kind of fight Jesus took on for us when he called out death for us and won, unquote. And I said, is that the gospel? Um, what is that? Something kind of alluding to it. <laughs> okay. <so laughs> 
Okay, chapter 29, I think this is the most problematic one. Quote, I used to think I could learn about Jesus by studying him, but now I know Jesus doesn't want stalkers. Oh, does this quote bother me? There's a reason God gave us his word. It's because we can know Jesus by reading his word. Those are his words to us. It displays his character. It's not being a stalker to study your Bible. This chapter was, I almost gave up after this chapter. I almost, I almost threw in the towel. I was like two chapters away, but I was just like so frustrated at this point. Quote, what I like about Jesus's message is that we don't need to study him anymore to know him. I just, let's keep going and then I'll just kind of wrap up my thoughts at the end. Jesus said that unless you know him like a child, you'll never really know him at all. What he's quoting there is Matthew 18, two through four. And then at the very end, he kind of like goes around where he, Bob, doesn't believe that Bible studies are good. Um, he calls them Bible doings, I think. Doesn't believe in Bible studies. I was just like, I was blown, like my mind was blown. I also made a realization. Of course, there's gonna be no scripture references coming from a guy who doesn't believe in studying the Bible. He doesn't believe in studying the Bible. So, and he says that, and I'm just like, what? what? We're not just called to sit in our room and study our Bible. We're called to, we're actually called to study our Bible and go out and do it. But he's almost taking the study part out of it and saying that like Bible studies are bad. I'm gonna fact check him one more time with this Matthew 18 verse. Okay, so his quote was, Jesus said that unless you know him like a child, you'll never really know him at all. At the time, the disciples came to Jesus saying, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And calling to him a child, he put him in the midst of them and said, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. That doesn't talk about knowing God like a child knows him. I think it's in, is it in 1 Corinthians? But anyways, talks about moving on from milk to solid food. Like we're supposed to mature and grow in our knowledge. We're supposed to mature and grow in our faith and our walk with God, but we're not supposed to know God like a child. If you don't know God like a child, you'll never really know him at all. It's talking about faith, um, but not knowledge. God wants us to grow in our knowledge of him. Like he delights that we know more about him. That's not what that verse is talking about at all. It's not talking about knowledge of him or that somehow that verse is backing your idea of not doing Bible studies anymore. It definitely doesn't give support for that. All these like notes for chapter 29, and then we go to the next page. I don't know if you can see that, but it's just like empty for the next two chapters. Um, chapter 31 was the very last chapter, and all I could put was, I'm just glad it's done. After chapter 29, I was just, I was done. I was done reading it. I was done being frustrated with it. Um, and just to have him so blatantly almost end his book by saying, you don't need to study your Bible, it was just a, what? I hope that this is helpful. If you've read it, give me your thoughts. We can have a conversation in the comments. Um, just kind of let me know. Um, if I got anything wrong, let me know. But uh, yeah, I'd be interested to hear what you guys think. Thanks for watching. Sorry it was kind of more negative, but I hope that it was helpful. And I will see you guys in my next video. My battery literally almost died. Oh no, it's not my battery, it's my memory. Oh my gosh, I almost ran out of memory. I've been talking for too long.